very good, perfect. So lectures about flavor. So let me give you, first of all, a brief outline of what we see this week. OK, so what are the main topics? So that we don't get uh, lost into the details, but at least we have you know, a general overview of what we are going to discuss. Um, so for today, um, so today we'll do some uh, intro. Um, Focusing in particular on the standard model flavor structure, so standard model flavor, um, with, the, with the aim of uh, basically having uh, everybody on the same, uh, uh, yeah, having sort of more or less the same uh, knowledge about flavor, at least uh, the basics. And then afterwards, we'll have the more fun stuff, right? Uh, so, what we'll see is that uh, is what we learn. from the measurements. Um, so, what, um, so I am a theorist, and uh, everybody here, yeah, we are theorists. But uh, um, as I will try to show you during these lectures, uh, um, the, the experiments in flavor physics are really exciting. Um, we have uh, many, many experiments, so I won't focus only on uh, LHC uh, measurements, in particular LHCB measurements, but we see that we have many more experiments, uh, if you want, smaller scales, but uh, uh, that will give us a lot of information about the flavor structure nature. Uh, so what we will learn from measurements, both in the context of uh, effective field theories, so we'll use uh, some of the, of, uh, you know, of the knowledge that, uh, of the things that we have learned with, uh, with Tim, uh, earlier during this uh, summer school, as well as we learn something about uh, new physics models. Um, so new physics models, what I mean is, uh, you know, thinking about uh, additional new degrees of freedom that we are not integrating out, uh, but what we learn on the presence of new particles, what, what uh, type of flavor structures these uh, new particles should have, okay? Um, then, third topic is uh, um, how to write a theory of flower. Um, because, you know, if you want from here and from here, we'll conclude that, uh, uh, you know, measurements are telling us that the flower nature is not too incredibly far away from uh, the prediction of the standard model. And then the question is, indeed, if you go beyond the standard model, uh, what type of theory we are allowed to write down. So in particular, we'll focus on uh, symmetry principles and, uh, you know, interesting theory, theory mechanisms that are telling us that we don't have uh, too uh, huge new physics effect on the flavor measurements, uh, uh, on the flavor observables that we are measuring. And, um, and then we have, uh, um, hope that you can uh, read at the end of the, uh, of the room. Um, so we have, we speak about a little bit about flavor at high energy. Because as we will see, so this uh, first part here will deal with uh, mesons, uh, in particular B and K on, uh, B mesons and K ons. Then we would like to understand what type of uh, high energy, so high PT uh, measurements we can uh, do at LHC, so at Atras and CMS, to test flavor. As well as, uh, we'll mention a little bit uh, something opposite, if you want. So, what uh, flavor experiments, uh, like indeed LHCB, or as we'll see, uh, NA62, and so on and so forth, can tell us uh, about uh, new physics particles. Um, New physics, uh, so direct uh, discovery of new physics. Um, so there are flavor observables, so if you uh, flavor experiments, if you think about the DLHCB experiment, uh, you think immediately about uh, flavor physics, right? But what I want to highlight a little bit uh, is that uh, this uh, type of experiments can also discover directly new particles. And the same also applies to lower energy experiments like NA62 or uh, the Cotto experiment, uh, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, finally, we speak about flavor anomalies. Uh, 
Um, so how many of you heard about uh, that there are some anomalies measured by the LHCB? Mainly? OK, very good. So I will try to, to give you quite a bit of details and what theorists uh, think about uh, these, uh, these anomalies. And this is actually you know, a quite exciting uh, uh, research topic, so something that uh, people working on Flavor are quite excited about in the last, uh, say, five years or so. And uh, so I will give you some information about the theories and some information about what we uh, think and plan to learn more in the coming years coming from the experimental measurements. Okay? So that's uh, the overview. And then uh, basically this organization here, we start from something kind of pedagogical to something more research-based. So this to say that uh, you, know, you can interpret this as you want. So if, you, uh, if today you are bored, you can think, OK, something better will come. Um, and uh, yeah, this is my interpretation of this. <laughs> OK, so so first of all, let's uh, start with uh, why Flavor. So with this, I mean, why we believe that the Flavor physics is interesting and why we believe, I hope, that these lectures are, are interesting. Um, so um, first of all, there are many unknown, as we see. So many, many things that we don't really understand theoretically. So we can have uh, tons of measurements, uh, but uh, from the theory point of view, it's hard to you know, understand deeply why the measurements work as they work. Okay? And uh, if you want, what we see today is what we call the standard model flavor puzzle. Um, then uh, so something that um, a lot of theorists find interesting is that there is a strong uh, connection between uh, um, different areas uh, of, uh, of, uh, of physics. Because as we see, we have uh, you know, the experimental program that has really to go hand in hand with the theory program. And the theory program, we have, you know, a lot goes here because we have uh, you know, people doing BSM, people doing QCD uh, calculations. And uh, in particular, in this uh, QCD calculation, we are uh, speaking about uh, lattice. Uh, calculation. So here and there, I will comment uh, what is the role of uh, lattice uh, to you know, understand uh, flavor measurements. Okay? And, um, and in this respect, so what, what I want to show you and convince, uh, and convince you is that at the end of this, uh, this week, I would like to, that you go home and you have as a, as a take home message that we have really huge progress in uh, all these directions. So. Because basically, most of these uh, measurements are really precision measurements. Uh, and uh, you cannot have a precision measurement. Uh, your measurement wouldn't be useful if, at the same time, you don't have a theory that, he, that can also predict uh, the corresponding observables in a, uh, as precise as possible manner. Okay. Um, and um, so if you take this, so if you take the experiments, uh, um, so the leading uh, um, the leading experiments for these uh, um, lectures will be LHCB as well as Bell 2. Um, now, these experiments, as we know, are uh, running. Actually, what is very interesting is that this uh, Bell 2 experiment uh, starting, uh, started again uh, uh, data taking. So there have been uh, collisions uh, in April uh, uh, this year, 26th of April, actually. Um, so we had uh, this experiment running in the last few years. We had uh, the Bell experiment. Uh, and now there is a new phase of this experiment called Bell 2 that started uh, uh, colliding, uh, uh, co started collisions in, uh, on April 26. Uh, and, and actually, in terms of luminosity, um, if you compare LHCB, say, future, with LHCB um, 1 inverse to Barno data and Bell, Bell 2 over Bell, you see that you have something like a factor of 50. 
So Bell 2 is uh, supposed to uh, be collecting something like 550 times more luminosity than Bell. And the same, you know, for LHCB, LHCB will collect at least 50 times more data than uh, at RAN1. Uh, there are actually proposals for uh, having uh, even uh, 300 uh, inverse phantom bar node data at uh, the so-called high luminosity stage. Okay, so in parallel to the high luminosity uh, experiments, Atlas and CMS. Okay, and um, so this is my second bullet point. Also, what we uh, find interesting in Flavor is that in the past um, we had uh, a few indirect discoveries before the direct ones. So what do I mean with this? <clears throat> so what do I mean is that uh, you know, many of these uh, flavor, uh, observables that we are measuring now um, were measured already quite a bit in the past. Uh, and we saw some sort of anomaly. So let me make an example. So in the 70s, um, we measured for the first time this decay mode. So the k long, so this uh, k on, going to mu plus, mu minus. Okay? So we could measure the rate. We could measure the branch ratio. And we saw that this was tiny. This was very small. Okay. Um, now, back then, uh, we knew only uh, the existence of uh, three quarks. So mm -hmm. the up, down, and strange quark. We didn't know the existence of the charm. And actually, theoretically, if we did the calculation of this branch ratio using only three quarks, we got something that, uh, so theory, branch ratio was relatively sizable. So there was some mismatch with the theory that we had uh, back then and the measurement that we did. And this told us in indirectly that uh, we had to have uh, um, a fourth quark, the charm quark. Okay. But this, as you see, has nothing to do with uh, producing directly to our experiment a uh, charm quark. This was simply a, a measurement that was not really fitting our old theory that told us that some new degree of freedom should have existed. Okay. We'll learn actually how this worked. So we'll do actually the G mechanism today, I think, and we'll learn uh, why we concluded this from this measurement. But this is something interesting because, you know, we can hope also in the future maybe to have some indirect discovery having precision measurements. Okay. Um, then finally, so one thing that uh, was not uh, um, that, that we see during these lectures um, is uh, CP violation. Okay. So we won't discuss only about uh, flavor physics, but also we'll discuss about uh, uh, the physics involved with the CP violation. And then what is interesting with CP violation is that there might be some connection uh, between the CP violation that we measure in nature and uh, the baryon antibaryon asymmetry. So this per se tells us that indeed having more and more measurements that are telling us what is the CP natural, uh, the, the, the CP of nature is uh, super interesting because we can learn something about the mechanism. Of course, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, but still we learn something about this. Okay. And, uh, and, um, yeah, and then finally, I can put in this list why this is interesting are the, the anomalies uh, that uh, we really would like to understand more if uh, these anomalies uh, that we have observed in data is something maybe in the, in the measurements, so something that we don't un understand in our measurement, or is instead something that, uh, that is telling us that maybe there is some, uh, something beyond the standard model. Okay. Uh, very good. So this was a little bit of uh, motivation uh, um, for, for flower physics. I didn't tell you at the beginning, but I, I really hope that you ask me a lot of questions because in this way it's uh, less boring for everybody, especially in the afternoon, but also at 9 a.m. and tomorrow we'll have 9 a.m., so even more. So 
questions are very welcome. Um, yeah. So is the charm contribution like a large cancellation? Charm contribution, yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we we'll see maybe in 40 minutes or something like that. Yeah. <coughs> but um, yeah, cancellation that you have to think as a natural cancellation is not uh, something that you would uh, think about fine tuning or these sort of things, as we see. It's a nice mechanism. Okay, so so let's start um, to discuss the um, standard model uh, flavor structure. Okay, so uh, typically, you know, flavor lectures start with uh, counting number of free parameters. Um, this, I think, is interesting for several reasons. One is that it should show you that. Uh, the flavor part of the uh, standard model Lagrangian is probably the most uh, messy in terms of uh, you know, free parameters. We have uh, tons of free parameters. And also it should uh, teach us a little bit about uh, symmetries, uh, something that uh, then we'll use uh, later this week when we um, discuss about, uh, for example, minimum flavor violation. Okay. So let's start with uh, uh, counting uh, free parameters. So free parameters. and uh, symmetries. Um, OK, so um, just a little bit on notation. Uh, I will use this notation throughout this, um, this week, so for this, uh, all these lectures. Um, so in terms of the Quark and Lepton uh, 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 gauge representations uh, that uh, we'll use, so what we have, uh, so write this SU3 times SU2 times U1. So this, is, uh, this should be pretty known from uh, you know, uh, particle physics classes, uh, but uh, let's uh, just fix the not notation. Okay. So my left-handed uh, uh, quark tablet, this is uh, uh, given by this representation here of the gauge group. Okay. This is, then we have uh, the right-handed up. Minus to a third. So this I'm using the conjugate. That's why this this is a minus sign. Then the IC. And then we have the corresponding lepton. Um, so this is a three one one third. So these are all uh, our quark and uh, lepton representations. Yeah. Uh, the, Sorry? The free bar the Oops. <laughs> Very good. I'm testing you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, this is all fine. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Very good. And also, yeah. Uh, very good. Thank you, guys. Yeah, perfect. Any other thing? OK. All oh, the rest is right. Um, then, OK, we have also now the Higgs doublet. Uh, for me, I'm using this. Uh, so for me, the upper charge is plus 1 half. It has just to be consistent. It could be one, minus 1 half. Um, and then let's see the several pieces of the Lagrangian, right? So let me write them here. So if I write down the Lagrangian, we have some kinetic part, x part um, plus the part of flavor. Of course, I didn't mention, but uh, this i for me is a flavor index, so this is uh, 1, 2, 3. Okay. Um, so let's, um, let's take the several pieces. Okay. So we have this kinetic part here. Okay. Um, 
So this kinetic part is, uh, is easy to write down, right? Uh, so we will have pieces like uh, d mu x, uh, x. Then we have all the no, gauge part, like, uh, you know, I'm writing that kind of with all the gauge bosons, right? Uh, I'm not writing all of them. We have gluons and, uh, you know, SU2 with gauge boson and U1. And then uh, finally we have uh, the flavor part. So we have psi i, d slash. So where this psi is simply a vector of all these representations. Okay. Now, the reason I'm writing this is that, uh, okay, from here we can count, first of all, that we have only three free parameters. This will be the gauge couplings, right? And then also what I want to highlight here is that actually this part here I am putting flavor indexes, even if the flavor structure is super simple, right? We have a diagonal uh, thing. So the, the covariant derivative won't depend on the, on the exact flavor that I'm picking up. Okay? Um, very good. So from here, actually, we see that uh, this piece of the Lagrangian will have... Uh, so what is the symmetry of this uh, piece of the Lagrangian, actually? Question for you. Mm -hmm. Very good. So we'll have, if you want, u3 to the fifth power. So one uh, u3 for each uh, uh, representation. Okay? Because, as we said here, now we can do a u3 uh, transformation, flavor transformation for uh, each of these uh, no, qi, li, and so on and so forth. Is that good for everybody? Okay, so we see that we have a huge uh, symmetry. We have to keep in mind this, okay? And overall, the, the structure is very simple. Um, what else? So this Higgs part, we have, uh, uh, you guys have already discussed during this uh, uh, Tazi summer school. This is even uh, simpler, well, sort of. <laughs> um, but you can write it as uh, simply mu minus lambda x to the fourth. Again, you have two free parameters. Uh, flavor indexes, of course, are not entering. And, uh, and then finally, let's take this last piece here. So this is uh, the part of the Yukawa interactions, uh, right? And this is where the, the main action for flavor is, uh, is, uh, is coming from, right? So what we have, uh, as we know, are several of these Yukawa interactions. So we'll have uh, ij, E, e J. So this is for the, you know, for my leptons, and then I can correspondingly write down also the, the quark, so up and down quarks, right? Um, so I will have, uh, let me write all of them. So I have the up one. Um, so this is uh, conjugate. J plus okay. Maybe the side be a one. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Hey, it's a coupling, right? You can, yes. Very good. Yeah. Um, okay. So first of all. What we know is that, so in all generality, we expect that each of these metrics, so this, uh, as you see, I have two flower indexes, i and j, so i and j equal to 1, 2, 3. Therefore, all these y's are uh, 3 times 3 uh, complex uh, matrices, right? Um, so already from here, you know, without uh, thinking too much, we can see that if we take uh, uh, these Yukawa couplings to be totally generic, uh, we are really, uh, we are really uh, breaking this flavor symmetry, u3 to the fifth power, right? Uh, because I cannot do any more uh, these rotations uh, uh, for each of the representation, uh, so this won't be any more invariant, uh, right? 
So the question is, uh, if I write for you a Lagrangian like this, uh, we would like to understand uh, what is the breaking uh, of this flower symmetry that we are having. Uh, okay. So that's uh, what we want to do now. Okay. So. Okay, let's uh, maybe focus on the lepton sector that is kind of easier. Okay. So in the lepton sector, uh, so we have, okay, let me rewrite them here. So we'll have two kinetic terms. So we'll have this uh, d slash i. And then we'll have that Yukawa. <coughs> so this is all I have for the lepton sector. Okay. Um, so following what uh, what you said before, right? So here I have my u three to the second power, right here. Because I have one new three for this uh, E representation and one new three for this L representation, right? And then uh, let's see what, uh, how, how we are breaking this symmetry here, right? So is somebody, can somebody guess what is the breaking here? If I ask you, or how would you approach the problem? <laughs> Uh, we speaking, sorry. <laughs> Very good. So let's see if this is uh, right. So so what uh, so the reason I guess you are thinking about u one cube uh, is that uh, maybe we have still some phases associated to each of the field. Is that right? So for example, if you you know, split this, uh, this multiplet here. So let's write down the, uh, the flavor index, uh, index uh, in an explicit manner. So here we'll have uh, E, mu, and tau, right? So this is my I index. And what we have uh, is uh, one phase associated to each of these fields, okay? And this phase is invariant even if I put these u covers. And so this is uh, actually the correct answer. But uh, uh, let's see how we can uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, having a little bit more formalized this, so that, you know, if I give you a super bad Lagrangian, we know how to count, count uh, the, the number of, uh, you know, what is the symmetry that is left, uh, okay? So, um, in general, uh, what we have uh, is that the number of free parameters um, simply equal. So free parameters, what I mean are uh, free uh, physical parameters. So something that I cannot, uh, you know, uh, rotate away or face it away or anything. This is something completely physical. Okay. So the number of free parameters uh, in any, you know, Lagrangian that you can write down are equal to the number of parameters that I have. For example, if I have, uh, you know, a complex uh, three times three Yukawa coupling, then I will have 18 parameters, right? Uh, minus the number of uh, broken uh, generators. Okay. So let's see if we apply this equation here, what we learn for the lepton sector. So how many free parameters we have in the lepton sector? Okay. So here, as I already told you, here we have 18 parameters. Right? So these are the parameters contained in the Yukawa coupling complex, three times three uh, matrix. Uh, broken degenerators. So how many broken generators we have uh, if, we pa if we have this, uh, this breaking here? So we have, we have uh, U3 to the second power going to U1 to the third power. Uh, 
I hear a 15 from somewhere here. And uh, 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 there was, everybody says 15? OK, very good. <laughs> OK. And actually, that is true, because as we know, we have three free parameters in the lepton sector, and this corresponds to the masses of the several leptons, right? Uh, now, one question that I would ask if I was you is, OK, you know, what about the PMNS matrix? Um, so this uh, matrix uh, uh, that is uh, you know, mixing the several neutrino flavors, uh, right? So here, we don't see anything about it. But the reason is that so my minimal Lagrangian uh, here doesn't involve any mixing uh, right, of the lepton flavor. I would need to add, for example, right-handed neutrinos for that. Okay? So effectively, as we expected, we have three free parameters okay, in the lepton sector. Now, for the quark sector, it's slightly more complicated, but not too much, actually. So. So can, can somebody already tell me the answer for the, for the quark sector exactly, you know, first this uh, breaking here and the number of free parameters? So starting from the breaking, we started with uh, what symmetry? Very good. So. And then uh, what is the, the global symmetry that is actually left uh, once that we add uh, this, uh, this and this u kappa coupling? So it's a well-known symmetry. <laughs> So is the, is the baryon number conserved? Yes, no? So looking just at that Lagrangian, I mean, without, uh, okay? So at least I have this U1 of the baryon number, okay? And actually this is the, the path of the breaking for the quark sector, okay? Um, And, um, and then, uh, basically, what you can do is, uh, again, to do this equation of counting the number of, uh, of uh, physical free parameters. And uh, so let's see. Let, let me write them here. It's easier. Well, okay. so, so for the quark. So for the quark, we have um, um, two Yukawa couplings, right? So we'll have 36 free parameters, 36. And then uh, how many uh, broken generators? 20. Very good. Um, 26. So we have these 10 free parameters. What are they? Three masses. Sorry, three masses in the up sector, three masses in the down sector, so six. And then, as we see, four free parameters in the CKM, so in the mixing between the several quarks. Okay, so it works. We're not doing any mistake here. Okay, so beyond uh, the, count, the exact counting on the, num on the number of free parameters, what I want uh, that you notice here is that, first of all, if you compare the flavor sector to the gauge and the Higg sector, this is kind of a mess, if you want, because we have so many free parameters, right, that um, our theory is not really telling us anything about those, okay? Um, so why so many free parameters? Because, of course, I mean, having an elegant theory, we, we would like, uh, you know, to have something that is telling us that we would expect uh, this number of free parameters, and then also we would expect what is the, the strength of these parameters. And this is something that we don't have, really. Okay. Yeah? Is Hubble's spell also uh, an, an axial E1 under which the X is also charged? Um, so this is, uh, uh, let's see. 
I don't think so. If you, I think this is not physical in this respect. So if you write down just the colors, uh, this wouldn't be a, a, a non-broken symmetry actually, because um, so it depends also how you define it. Uh, because uh, as you see here, we have still uh, four uh, uh, u1 prime uh, u1 that are uh, left unbroken. So it depends a little bit on the on the on the definition if you want, but these are the only you know uh, symmetries that are left at this uh, classical level of having Lagrangian like this. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, yeah, the other thing that I want that you actually keep in mind for later is that um, when we will try to write down uh, meaningful uh, uh, theories of flavor. Um, we have uh, to remember this uh, U3 to the fifth power symmetry, as well as uh, this breaking here that we have seen, uh, that we can simply write it down. Uh, you know, you can pick uh, four you want uh, as you want, uh, but uh, we'll pick these ones here. So E and PC queen. You can, uh, you know, any linear combination would be fine. Um, so this is something for, uh, let me say, for Wednesday probably that we'll discuss uh, how to apply to new physics uh, theories of flavor. Okay. Um, so how am I doing with time, actually? Okay, very good. Um, and, um, and then actually, uh, so in the quark sector, we could do also similar counting, uh, separating uh, real uh, parameters and, uh, and phases. And what you see is that you have uh, here nine real parameters plus one phase. Actually, I would leave you as, a, as an exercise, really, to demonstrate that uh, between these 10, we have nine real and uh, one phase. I mean, we know physically that this is the case, but you can demonstrate it uh, uh, just using uh, uh, group theory. OK. Um, OK, so. So now that we have learned a little bit about the symmetries of, uh, uh, that are connected to flavor, let's discuss um, the CKM matrix. So this is uh, our next topic. Um, so, um, so this is something, you know, historically that was uh, uh, proposed in the 73. Actually, in 63, there was a uh, so I think, uh, you know, I'm Italian, so maybe I always feel that I should mention this, uh, that, uh, <laughs> so in 63, uh, Kabibo was, uh, right, uh, Tillman? <laughs> so in 63, there was uh, this idea of uh, Kabibo having one angle, as we see this theta one, two, for the mixing between first uh, and second generation. So this is, uh, the Italian parenthesis is closed. Um, um, so, what, uh, what is the CKM matrix and what we know experimentally about it? Um, so, um, first of all, if you take, uh, as we know, right, if you take this, uh, you cover Lagrangian, uh, you replace the Higgs with the BAV, uh, you give uh, mass to all these uh, quarks and leptons, particularly correlated to the quarks, you can rotate in such a way to be in the basis of uh, mass eigenstates. And, uh, and what you learn is that once you do the rotation, so what you need to do is the following. You take uh, Q left uh, I. So I'm writing down the two SU2 components. And um, uh, so this will be equal to, you have a rotation matrix uh, for up quark, up quarks, IJ. Actually, let me put here. Sorry. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just a silly question. Sure. Um, I, I thought the remaining three U ones in the left hand sector were the electron number and muon number and whatnot. Mm. That's not the case. Yeah. Different. Yeah, as I said. Uh, different combinations of these that's right. Uh, it's a matter of convention. Okay. So the, this for me is the electron number. Uh, you can put muon number. The importance is that you have. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. In total, you have four of them. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay. 
So, um, yeah, so the thing that we need to do here is to rotate to mass against states, as we know. And, uh, and here is uh, the time that we, uh, uh, we get to our CKM matrix. So let's see um, how we can define the CKM matrix. So, um, so this is uh, u left prime j. This kappa. So what I'm doing here is something you know relatively simple, as we know that. Um, so I will have um, say the u left uh, i is simply equal to. Let, let write down this. So both for uh, up and down, I will have to do a rotation that I define this way. So this is q i j dagger q left prime. J, where these prime uh, fields are mass against states. And these are Fravor against states. Okay, so I need to do this rotation in such a way to diagonalize all my Yukawas. No? But then you see that uh, basically, again, you can see it counting the number of degrees of freedom, but what you need uh, are two different uh, rotation matrices. One in the up sector and one in the down sector. That's why I put here uh, the Q. Okay? And you can see here the mismatch, right? Um, so you have on one rotation for the up component and one rotation for the down component. Okay? Um, and then, uh, yeah, this combination here, or rotation matrices, uh, this is what we call the CKM matrix. Okay? So this is uh, V CKM J kappa. Okay? So as you see here, we are breaking this uh, SU2 invariance uh, because of this different rotation. So let's write here. But then, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what do we get for the Lagrangian once that we go to mass against states because these are our physical particles? Um, so, uh, what we get, so if you look at, uh, at um, where is it, uh, that uh, kinetic part uh, that I brought down there for the several fermions, so you will have a piece that goes like this. So you have uh, G over 2. Then you have uh, Q left I. You know, TA, and then you have Q left I. So you have pieces like this, right, uh, with the interactions with the SU2 uh, gauge bosons, right? So this is uh, my flavor against it part. Then I do this rotation here, okay? And uh, what I get, uh, um, so we get uh, G over, okay, we'll have some. Let me co not count the square root of 2 or 2. I could put them, but... Uh, um, so what I will get uh, are pieces like this. U left, I, prime, uh, gamma mu. Then I have P left up. I, J, P, L. Prime, and then I have my W boson, W mu. So here, just done the rotation that we saw here. And this is uh, my Lagrangian for mass eigenstates. So the conclusion from here is that you see that uh, now, so I started with something that was diagonally flavor. So I had the same index i and i here and here and end up in some, with something that is not anymore uh, um, flower diagonal. So this, uh, in general, this i is different from j. Okay? Um, and, uh, and from this Lagrangian here, I will have actually, you know, uh, interactions of this type, where you have uh, a w boson, then you have u left i, d left uh, j, 
and uh, yeah, here I will have uh, dependence on CCKM IJ. Okay. So what we see from here is that the flavor is broken, if you want, so we don't have any more diagonal interactions. Okay. And actually, so as a you know, a possible exercise uh, that you can do is to demonstrate that this is uh, the only interaction that I have uh, at the tree level in the standard model that is breaking flavor. So you can demonstrate, for example, as we expect uh, no, from, uh, from gauge invariance, uh, that you don't have the corresponding uh, photon coupling, right? Uh, you don't have uh, uh, right coupling, uh, I don't know, like, uh, uh, let me write something really bad and then I will erase it immediately afterwards. Uh, gamma, mu, and then uh, down in the strange. You don't have couplings like this. No, this is gauge invariance. But then you can also say the same thing for uh, uh, couplings with a, with a Z boson uh, and uh, also the corresponding couplings with the Higgs boson. Okay. So the only, so this is the only um, three level uh, uh, flavor breaking interaction. <coughs> okay, even if, uh, you know, uh, this is, if you want, a way of parameterizing it. I could do something different putting the flavor violation in the Higgs sector, if you want, uh, because uh, really the flavor violation comes from the Higgs sector from Mayokawa couplings. Uh, but then, yeah, it's actually much easier if we, you know, conventionally we use this, uh, uh, these interactions where the W is the source uh, uh, I mean, where the W has these uh, flavor violating couplings at the tree level. Okay? Very good. <coughs> so, so. Um, come right here. So you might wonder, no, if I ask you uh, to write down a, a diagram that is mediating a flavor transition of this type. So you have a strange quark going to a down quark. Uh, how are you going to write down a, a Feynman diagram that is mediating an interaction like this? Oh, sorry, I thought that you were going to say something. <laughs> um, so here you see that I'm not changing the charge. So this is, as we call, uh, flavor changing uh, neutral current. So this is, uh, I will write several times this with this uh, abbreviation here. Uh, what might bother you is that, uh, you know, I told you we have only this interaction here, right? Uh, but this is an interaction with the W that is charged, uh, so we don't have the neutral uh, uh, transition, right? So actually, this tells us that we cannot write down anything at the tree level that is mediating a flavor change in neutral current, okay? Um, so if I want to write down, uh, you know, a transition like this, uh, say where two strange quarks are becoming two down quarks, uh, can only write down loops, can give you an example. Of course, loops that are involved in that interaction, they are the W interaction. Okay. Um, so I can write down uh, something like this. Here I have a W, another W, and then here I put S, S, D, D, and here I have all the up quarks. Is that right? Um, so, what we learn is that they have to be at least, uh, so these flavor change intercurrents have to be at least at one loop, if not more, okay? So we expect that these are relatively rare, right, because we'll have at least the scaling like g squared over 16 pi squared, okay? 
and this is, uh, you know, already telling us that uh, whatever, you know, transition of this type we are going to measure is a rare transition. That's why, you know, if you think about the experiments, these are uh, generically high intensity experiments because we need a lot of data in such a way to measure well these type of processes. Okay. Um, let me let me make an example of a, of a couple of processes. Okay. Um, right here. So let's uh, compare, since we are going to speak a lot about uh, B mesons, let's, uh, let's make the first example for B meson uh, decays. Okay? So let's take a, a B minus. Okay? Um, this can decay to a D meson. So this is a D bar meson L nu. And then let's compare this branch ratio here with uh, another branch ratio, say, still of the B minus. B minus, okay, show the K minus, uh, and then uh, L plus L minus, okay? So you look at PDG, okay, first thing, uh, if you want, and what you learn is that uh, this is something like 2%, um, and this is uh, something like 5, uh, 10 to minus 7. Um, so when you see this, uh, so, you know, different numbers, there must be some physical reason, right? Uh, so can somebody tell me why uh, these branch ratios are so incredibly different? I mean, I don't want that you compute that, but there is a... That's great, yeah. In fact, I can write down for this uh, three-level uh, diagram that will be B charm going to W and nu. So this is the, the Feynman diagram that is mediating this process. Um, but I mean, you look at the quark content of these guys and this is uh, U bar B and this is U bar C, okay? And then you do the same here and here you have only a loop um, because again, this is U bar B, this is S U bar. So you have to B going to S, neutral, loop. And then, okay, if you're curious of the diagram, you have something like this. So B, S, W, top. And then you have a Z, lepton, lepton, for example. Okay. And then we expect that indeed there is a, a large hierarchy between branch ratios. Okay. Um, very good. So, let's um, uh, I think I can write here. So I'm getting to those uh, those figures there. I just need a little bit of time, but uh, almost there. <laughs> um, so, how to parameterize the CKM matrix, first of all? Um, so, the CKM matrix uh, uh, is a unitary matrix, right, that can be written uh, as a product of three rotations on three orthogonal axes. So you can write down as, uh, okay, R1, R2, R3. Um, where here you have uh, an angle theta to three, so the rotation between uh, second and third generation. So you forget about the first generation for this uh, rotation here. Um, here you have uh, one three angle, and here finally the one two angle, okay? Um, of course, I mean, this you see that you have only three, three, three parameters, but we have learned that we need also to have a phase, okay? And this is something now that we can put in one of these rotation matrices. Where you put it exactly is uh, just a convention, so it doesn't really matter much, uh, but um, typically people put it in this uh, R2 rotation. So at the end of the day, the R2 rotation will be written as uh, cosine of that one three, 
if you have a zero because the second generation is not involved, then sine theta one three. This phase, then you have zero one zero, and then finally. So again, this is just a convention, just that this is a, a physical phase, so it should be somewhere. Um, very good. And um, so this is what we call the standard uh, parameterization. Of the CKM matrix. Um, and then we have another parameterization that is an approximated one. So let's uh, write here. So, um, Experiments are telling us uh, what these angles are, right? Um, so we know simply experimentally that we have a large hierarchy. So we have that, uh, say, theta 1, 3 is uh, much smaller than theta 2, 3 that is much smaller than theta 1, 2. This is just a fact, this is some, some measurement, OK? Um, so this is. Uh, So using this measurement, uh, the idea is uh, to write down the CKM uh, in an approximated manner, considering this uh, as your expansion parameter. Okay? So this, um, this uh, theta 1, 2, you can call it lambda, that is this uh, Kabibo angle that we, I mentioned uh, before. Okay? And then you can write down uh, this, let me see, approximated. Actually, in this way here, I will write it down, and then I will explain uh, why I write down this equation, actually. Um, so this is uh, then we have uh, minus lambda. So why I'm writing down this uh, complicated matrix? Uh, so I want to highlight a couple of things. So, and then uh, okay, let's put plus uh, order lambda to the fourth. Um, so as you can see, I'm keeping uh, here only the first uh, three terms in lambda, this small parameter. Um, so this lambda is actually something like 0 0.23. Um, so you see that you have additional uh, three parameters as we would expect. So you have this uh, a, rho, and data. This we would expect them to be of the order one, if you want, since we do this expansion, order one. Also, what you see uh, from this matrix uh, is that, uh, if you want, uh, this can be seen as uh, the identity plus corrections, uh, right? Uh, um, so is there somebody who is doing uh, neutrino physics in the case? Nobody. OK. So I can comment, and nobody can tell me that this is wrong. <laughs> but that, uh, so of course, you can imagine that you can write down a similar matrix for the neutrinos. right? Uh, so this is what is called the PMNS matrix. And the structure is totally different. So you don't have identity plus corrections, but you have something that is much more uh, uh, you know, anarchical. Okay. Um, also, what you see from here is that, uh, and this is a historical note if you want, it's not such a bad approximation to consider only the first and second generation quarks mixing with a third generation that is giving a sort of a, you know, an additional contribution on top of that. So this is, uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, first and second generation mixing. Okay, and um, yeah, this is uh, 
all I wanted to say for this uh, parameterization that is actually that has a name, and this is the Wolfenstein parameterization. Um, now, you might uh, be bothered uh, by this thing here that I said that this is a convention where you put this space. So you could, in principle, put it in uh, either R1 or R3 also. And um, uh, actually, there is a, a quantity that is uh, independent on the convention. So let, let me see, let me show you what, what is this quantity. So first of all, as we can uh, guess, so this is a, a physical phase. So this, uh, as we will see, is telling us that we have uh, CP violation. Okay, so this is an important parameter. Now, can we write down something that is telling us in a basis independent way that we have CP violation? So what is a quantity that we can write down that is independent on basis? Hmm? Sorry? Very good, yeah, determinant. Um, there is another one that is uh, not exactly the same, <laughs> that is actually called the, the, the Yarskog invariant. Have, you, have some of you heard that? Okay, so Yarskog invariant. So we want to write down something that is measuring the amount of CP violation that we have. Okay, that is uh, basis independent. So what we can define is this quantity here. So let's take the imaginary part of uh, some combination of, uh, of the CKM elements. So let me write down this combination here. So we have uh, V, I, J, V, cap, L. So I hope that you can read the indexes actually. Um, Um, so here, as you see, I have uh, four flower indexes, i, j, k, and l. I'm not summing over them, so I can choose whatever, whatever flower index here. And for any of this combination, we can demonstrate that this is uh, nothing other than uh, j, so this uh, uh, parameter that we are looking for. And then uh, this sum here, sum over two other flower indexes, let me call them M and N, of a combination of antisymmetric tensors. So this is epsilon I, K, M, epsilon J, L, N. So this is something that, you know, is kind of easy to, to, to demonstrate that whatever index you take, you can write it down as uh, some uh, you know, some invariant, invariant meaning that we don't really care about the basis that we are using, times this combination of antisymmetric uh, uh, tensors. Okay. Of course, you can, uh, you know, stick to a basis, uh, say the basis that we showed here, and write it, write down this J quantity. We can do that, and to show you that indeed this is uh, indeed the measurement of CP violation. Otherwise, from here it's kind of hard. No. Um, so can demonstrate that uh, J is uh, equal to this combination, cosine of theta 1, 2, so I have all these cosines of the three angles, the corresponding sine, theta 2, 3, and then finally I have time, sorry, times sine of delta. Um, again, this is an easy exercise once that you consider this step here of parameterization and of basis. Now, what do we learn from this expression here? There are certain things. So one is that, uh, as I promised, that we want to have something that is testing uh, the CP violating phase. And indeed, we see that the J goes to zero for, uh, for the delta for the phase going to zero. Okay, very good. 
But then also there is another interesting aspect here. So you see, so this is a long expression, but uh, what you can see is that uh, we have dependence on uh, uh, every angle, so theta 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3. So if any of this angle is 0, uh, you don't have this uh, quantity, this J, you don't have this CP violation. That's right. From here it's obvious. Um, so what, what do we learn from here? You want to say something? That's right. So we need three generations to have CP violation. Okay. So in a world where you have only two quark flavors, you don't have CP violation. And this is something now that we could have learned also, you know, counting number of degrees of freedom and so on, right? Okay. And this, uh, you know, we see this, uh, this aspect here just considering this uh, basis invariant uh, Jarskok uh, uh, quantity. Okay. So let's see how uh, am I doing with time? I have five minutes. Um, okay, very good. Um, so let's see. Um, so what... Um, um, yeah, so I can comment a little bit on that uh, on that slide. So let me uh, just write down one more equation, and then we can go there. So. Now we would like to learn uh, how to test uh, this CKM matrix, right? So what are the measurements and, uh, uh, and, um, and if this is indeed the, the right description of nature. Now, since uh, the CKM is unitary, so we have several relations between the several elements, uh, right? So what we can write down are relations like this. So the sum over i um, of uh, V i d V i s is equal to zero, for example, right? Um, and uh, how many of these relations do we have? Can we write down? Yeah, I hear some s, so these <laughs> six relations of this type. So I have three relations when I change the, the, the down flavor and the three for the corresponding up flavor. You're not convinced? <laughs> or, yeah, I'm, uh, yes, you had the face a little bit. Okay. The, the last one, sorry? Oh, thank you. Yes, very good. Thanks. This you mean? Yeah. Two. Yes, very good. When there are too many indexes, I get. Uh, so this should be J. Thank you. Yeah, now it's correct, right? Thanks. Um, OK. Um, so these relations are telling us that we have six triangles, right? Because you can think about this uh, uh, CKM element as simply a side of one triangle, and then they add up to zero, OK? Uh, now, once that you have um, your triangle, then you can test if indeed uh, uh, you know, all, the, all the sides of the triangle are adding up to, you know, to, to a point. Right. Um, now, experimentally, there is only one triangle that is very much uh, uh, very well tested. And uh, this is uh, the triangle that is given by VID, VIB star. Um, so the reason being that if you take any other uh, triangle, um, the several sides uh, have a very different length. So you, what you can see, you know, so here, um, yeah, you can write it down explicitly, right? I mean, um, you will have a VUD, 
VUB star plus VCD VCB star plus VD, sorry, uh, VTB star. You can expand uh, each of these terms in power of lambdas, and you see that uh, each term uh, has the, the same power. Okay? That is good because it's telling you that these sides are more or less uh, the same. Uh, the same. Okay? If you take any other of the triangles, uh, you see a large hierarchy, so you learn that uh, it will be more difficult to test them, basically. Okay? That's why conventionally, conventionally this is uh, the unitarity triangle. Okay? And, uh, and then uh, what you can do is, uh, so le let me put the several vertexes of this uh, triangle. So you have one zero, and this is uh, the thing that you want to test. This is, uh, um, so these are the parameters of your Wolfenstein parameterization, where uh, I define this uh, row bar as actually a row over one plus lambda square. This is the definition. Um, now, what you need to do is to have uh, many measurements that are telling you where this point is, uh, right? And to see if indeed all the measurements agree. Okay. Um, so here I'm putting, uh, I'm showing this slide uh, mainly because I, I was lazy to, uh, to draw this, uh, these things by myself. But basically, so first of all, I want to show you the first thing that is kind of uh, immediately evident is the progress that we had in the several measurements, uh, uh, you know, if we start from 95 to 2016. So what you see here is the following. So here is the famous triangle, right? Uh, so this is the point that we want to determine, okay? And, uh, and the several uh, uh, shaded uh, colored regions are the regions... Well, okay, let me use that. Um, yeah. So the, the, the several uh, colored regions are the regions uh, uh, that experimentalists are telling us we should be in, right? So for example, as we see, we have the measurement of that MS and that MD. We see tomorrow what these are that are telling us that we should be in this, say, in this circle here, for example. Then we have, I don't know, the measurement of sino 2 beta is telling us to be here and so on and so forth, right? And what is interesting is that you see that all of these measurements are passing from uh, one point and uh, this area is pretty small. That is telling us that we were able to determine the CKM uh, triangle in a pretty uh, accurately, uh, pretty accurately, right? See here and you compared with the region uh, that we had in 95 or also in 2004, okay? And, uh, and uh, you know, putting together all these measurements, actually there are plenty, plenty of measurements, uh, you can extract all the parameters of the CKM matrix. And these are uh, the numbers, uh, no? You can, uh, yeah, find them uh, uh, um, uh, looking at uh, the CKM fitter website, or also there, are, uh, there is this UT fit collaboration that is doing this type of fit. And you see that uh, these numbers, so first of all, we have this Kabimbo angle. This is uh, uh, um, the, the theta one, two that we saw before. And you see what level of precision, right, that we achieved. So most of the time we are speaking about the precision that is uh, even sub percent, okay? So this is, a, if you want, a, a big result because it's telling us that this idea of having three generations of quarks that are mixing through the CKM and so on is, uh, a, you know, something that is realized in nature, or at least uh, we don't see big anomalies here, but we see basically a very small region where all the measurements uh, are crossing. Okay. So this is, uh, I think I should uh, yeah, stop uh, here, I guess. Um, yeah. So tomorrow we'll learn why we need uh, the charm quark as uh, following up on your question. Uh, and then we'll learn a little bit about uh, effective, uh, yeah, CP violation uh, and maybe effective fit theories. Okay. Any other question, guys? Yeah. Uh, is eta bar defined the same way as row bar? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if we had a fourth generation, is there like a nice geometric picture of the row? Yeah, so, so if you have a first generation, you would have a, a, I mean, this, but with a fourth term. So if you consider just the first three, you would not have a triangle that is closing up, basically, or something. Like 
This this one here? Yeah. So yeah, this is uh, yeah, it's pretty small. But so this is another measurement. Uh, so you have measurement for the beta angle. You have two solutions actually. One is uh, this solution here, and one is this solution here. You have just uh, you know two regions are uh, are good with the measurement, and uh, yeah, and and this solution is not a good solution. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It is the only one that doesn't pass from there. So. Mm -mm. Okay. So, no other question or. Oh well. So yeah, we see you tomorrow.